Hello guys, this is Frederick from Opeth, and um, we are about to release a new album called Last Will and Testament. Beautiful, Frederick. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. <clears throat> I'm actually hung over because the way I went up with the our guitar tech was here from the UK last night. And uh, we went for curries and beers. Curries so and I, beers. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a dangerous <laughs> night, dangerous combination. Yeah, we had one shot. I tried to stay away from the shot. We had one tequila shot, which was a bad decision. <laughs> but it was fun. So, yeah, yeah, life goes on. <laughs> it, it does indeed. <laughs> and, as you mentioned, bro, Opeth released your 14th studio album, The Last Will and Testament, on October the 11th. Like, it's only about three weeks away now, mate. Like, how are you feeling about it? Well, it's exciting times to, to see how it, the album's going to be received and... Uh, we do a lot of interviews right now, and uh, so far it seems, talking to journalists, like people really dig it, you know, and of course we released two tracks, Paragraph 1 and Paragraph 3 now, and the reception is, I would say, quite overwhelming, and that makes us happy, of course. But the uh, first criteria is when we do an album that we feel 100% happy with it. And in this case, we do. Yeah, right, it's a start. So could you tell us a bit more about the album from a musical point of view and what you were going for with it? Well, I think it's a good... Uh, it kind of assembles the old Opeth and the more proggy Opeth, last four albums kind of thing, in a more restless, compressed direction and also step forward, I think. It, the songs are slightly shorter, but they have more ingredients than ever. Uh, like a little bit like modern day society, even though the theme of the album takes place in the 1920s, which is apparently quite some time ago. But um, <laughs> when you listen to it, uh, like if you listen to Blackwater Park, so certain sections are dwelled upon quite long, and that's different with this album. This, there's uh, quite a lot of action. It's action-packed album, yeah. but I mean, not in a hysterical way. There is also what's a big part of Opel sound. You have the kind of the yin, yin and yang thing. You have a really heavy section, then you have something more melancholic, uh, beautiful-ish type of foresty sound as well. Uh, along those lines, mate, like the press release calls it your darkest and heaviest record that you've made in decades. Would, would you agree with that? I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It is really dark, and that was the one of the goals to make it really dark. But it's it's also at moments really beautiful. I think, mm -hmm. like, but beautiful can be beautiful in a dark way as well. But it is. It's quite evil sounding. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we like that. <laughs> so well, when you say that it was, it was one of your goals, mate, like, do you guys, before you go into the album process, do you sit down and, and make a list of, of goals that you want to achieve or things that you want to do with the album, or does that sort of more come as you're going? I think it kind of comes as it goes. Um, of course, the direction of the album is usually Michael says, oh, this is going to be the most darkest album ever. That's that's a common thing, and to to a certain point, I think uh, we achieved that, you know. But I think when we're in the work in pro progress, we just focus on one song at a time. Yeah, just try to do the best of it, and then not maybe necessarily looking at all the songs at once. Just take one thing at a time, basically. Yeah. Now, there's a beautifully unique conceptual story running through the album as well. Like you mentioned before, that it's set in the 1920s, but there's a lot more going on than that. I mean, can you can you run us through it briefly? Well, it takes place after World War One, uh, like a quite decadent time. People are celebrating, and it's basically the last will and testament is about this patriarch father, narcissist. Uh, guy very rich it's about his he's the revealing stuff in his life in this testament uh that his children's who's going to inherit don't know about right yeah uh, that could be different love affairs and 
uh, new siblings that they don't know about. Oh. So they're basically, it's basically three children, uh, the, the, the twins, and then you have a daughter who has a, like a skeleton disease that the actual patriarch, uh, he had a love affair with a maid, one of the maids, and that's that daughter. Okay. So have, it, it, it's, it's a bit messy story. Or, I mean, it has a lot of twists and turns. So the, the testament and will is not like just a testament where you're going to inherit. It's, it has a lot of poetry and also it reveals a lot of side stories yeah. through on. And, I mean, the album is seven paragraphs, which is the testament. Mm -hmm. And then the last track is the only one with the title, A Story Never Told which is actually a letter from this girl who suffers from polio that the patriarch had with the maid. So this is the letter from the maid long time after revealing something that not even the patriarch did was aware of. Wow. So this is a really, really twist in the storyline if you want to dig into it. I won't reveal it because that will probably, I don't want to spoil anything. Yeah. But, but people who are interested, they can dig in deeper into it. I think, I'm not sure, but the special edition vinyl will have like a printed testament in it. So you can read read it like a testament and will. That's awesome, bro. That's awesome. And this is, it's the first like out and out full concept record that you guys have ever made. So why did you decide that this was the right time in your career to actually do something like that? Well, was, the idea came from Michael and, we, we knew about it in the beginning, and the story of the concept was morphing all along during the writing process of the music. So, I mean, the story was crystallized like a, a month before we, or a couple of weeks before we went into the actual studio. The, yeah. But the concept idea was there from the get-go. But um, I think, I mean, Opeth has done the Still Life was a concept album, and My Arms, Your Hers. But this time around, it's more for real. Like mm. this concept is really thought through. It has more depth and more more thought put into it, basically. Yeah. Now, this is nothing really that new for Opeth, but but on this album, I think you've gone to the next level with it. Like you, the, the the use of atmospherics and moods that's created throughout those eight songs. It's it's amazing, mate. Like how how difficult is it to achieve that? that sense of foreboding, I guess, that you get through there with just music. Yeah, I mean, it, well, as, a, as a guitar player, I can only focus on one riff at a time. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's, it's really great to, to, you know, play with a person like Michael and the rest of the guys as well, because he really puts the musicians to, on it. he likes to challenge us all, you know. The way he writes stuff, and uh, he has a very unique way of writing riffs and rhythms. The beat could be straight, but there's so much polyrhythmical things beneath it that when you listen to it, it takes me a while to get it, to get the riffs into my DNA. Okay. And uh, talking about the solos, that's kind of my creative part, which on this album I I did them on my own. And I put a lot of thought into them. Like uh, on the, in Cowder, the previous album, I improvised most of them. Okay. With Michael this time around, <clears throat> Michael just sent it to me, and I I did it on my own, and uh, which was fun. You know, I, I tried to race the game and improve as a player, and uh, like everyone in the band, you know, every album, there is an ambition to raise the the bar. You know both musically as a unit but also as individual players you know yeah now speaking of michael mate like he's actually this he's brought back his death metal growls on this album for the first time since watershed in 2008 like was that something that you you sat and planned before going into the album or did it just just happen and you ran with it well we, we noticed that he kind of liked it a lot more because we do play all the old stuff live and he does the growl. We've been doing that apart from one tour we did after Heritage. We did one tour without the growls, which was a bit of a controversy. But um, it felt natural this time around. And it was not bringing it back just to, 
as a sales thing. It it served a purpose this time around, especially with the concept album, because it is one of the voices of this patriarch, the father. Uh, yeah, yeah. And also <clears throat> the clean vocals, and also Ian Anderson, who do, does narrations on the album, is also voice of the father. Even Joey Tempest, who sings a little bit, is also voice of the father. So, I mean, but for me, it's a big part of the Opeth legacy to have the growls back, and I, I'm very happy about it. But I know how Michael works. If we would have told him, we have to, you have to bring the growls back, <laughs> then he, would, he would do the total opposite. <laughs> so that's the way he works, you know. He has it has to come from him. He doesn't like to get be Tell pushed on. <laughs> exactly, he hates that, <laughs> and I know that because I've been playing with him for soon eighteen years, and I was just like, maybe it will happen, but I'm going to be quiet. And it happened, and I was very happy about it. <laughs> hey, patience does pay off sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, this is also your first album with um. I hope I get his name right. Well, Terry as a drummer. Um, yeah. What what did what did he bring to the overall sound of the album? He brought a lot. I mean, he's been working out great. We did three tours with him before we started working on the album, and he just nailed everything. He has the entire spectra, like extreme metal drummer, but he also has the um, what do you say the, the fingertip feel for more. The jazzier, progier parts. Even though he's uh, he's thirty, and we're like soon fifties. Actually, I've turned fifty. But, <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, he he really has the entire spectrum. And I don't think it's an easy task to be a drummer in Opeth because there's a lot of stuff going on. Especially with this new album, uh, the drums are super complex, really. And he told us he if he would have only gotten a month of time to learn this album, he wouldn't have been able to do it. So he was practicing for six months. Wow. Doing one, one song at, at a time. And I think really Michael, he he creates the drum patterns when he writes the songs. He, he's really picky when he does the demos. And um, they all they sound like almost like albums. But luckily enough, after we recorded the album, it sound more earthy and organic and more human maybe. Mm -hmm. When the, the rest of us is putting our uh, sk skills or whatever into it, you know. But Voltry, he just um, nailed everything. He, we the first track he recorded in the studio was Paragraph Three, mm -hmm. and he the first take was just there. But of course, as a drummer, he hears stuff we won't hear. So yeah. he uh, another one, another one, another one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, and also live he. Like the old stuff with the really fast double kick drums, it's so, so even the way he plays it. It doesn't sound like somebody's po uh, pouring out a bag of potatoes on the ground, you know. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> That's a great analogy. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> <laughs> All right, Frederick, well, thanks very much for your time tonight, mate. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. The Last Will and Testament is out on October the 11th. It's Fascinating storyline, fascinating concepts, sensational music, mate. So best of luck with it. I hope it does well. Thank you so much. Pleasure talking to you and thanks for talking to me.